Hey friends, welcome back. So in today's session, we're going to examine if there's any connection between consuming red meat and also protein and its correlations or links with cancer and focus on a specific molecular target that many people like to talk about when they make associations mechanistically with consuming red meat and protein and its links with cancer, and that is IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor one. There was a paper that I was made aware of by Dr. Gabriel Lyon and Stu Phillips on a recent podcast, and I want to play that clip shortly, but first talk to you about this paper and some problems associated with this paper as it pertains to the links between protein consumption and IGF-1 increases and that mechanistically causing neoplastic formation or formation of cancerous cells. The title of the paper here is low protein intake is associated with a major reduction in IGF-1 cancer and overall mortality in the 65 and younger but not older population. So I think this is an important paper to talk about because it was published in Cell Metabolism in 2014. It has since been cited over a thousand times, meaning it's in a high-impact journal and is considered a high-impact paper because many other people and authors and investigators are referencing this on, you know, as part of their work. And the problem herein, as Stu Phillips will explain very shortly, as he was interviewed by Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, who we've had on our podcast several times, um, they examine the nutritional epidemiological data that was analyzed as part of this paper that used a cellular model, a mechanistic model, combined with the epidemiological data in humans. Now, the problem herein, as Stu will explain, is the data set is quite small, making the associations with increased consumption of cancer, making that relative risk appear to be worse than it really is with regards to protein consumption and its links with cancer. Okay, so after the, the clip, we're going to talk more about IGF-1 because this has been really oversimplified by many people who are activists and, and proponents of going on a vegetarian or a vegan diet for fear that if you consume protein, what that is going to do in your body is go out and cause cancer because it increases IGF-1 because this paper said so. Now, the problem is it's not that simple. As you will soon learn, insulin-like growth factor one adheres to a U-shaped relationship and U-shaped curve with overall disease causation and mortality. Low levels of IGF-1 is actually as bad as having chronically elevated levels of IGF-1. It's like many things in life. There's a balance here. So I wanna continue to dive into the mechanisms about what IGF-1 does, how, what causes it to increase or decrease, and what are the favorable effects of IGF-1? Because guess what? You hear about IGF-1 and its links with causing cancer and chronic disease, but there's also favorable things that actually increase IGF-1, like exercise. IGF-1 has been shown to increase during exercise up to 20-fold. So on the one hand, you have activists saying, if you eat red meat, it will cause cancer by way of increasing IGF-1. Now you say, well, okay, if that was true, then wouldn't exercise also cause cancer? Because exercise acutely increases IGF-1. Like everything, there's nuance and there's context that we need to understand and differentiate and tease out. So that's where we're going today. But first, let's listen to this clip and this interview as part of Dr. Gabriel Lyons' podcast. And here is Stu Phillips. And I think you'll enjoy this little segment and then we'll unpack it and further get into the details of IGF-1. But when you say cancer risk is four times greater in one group versus another, um, it, you know, it, it, it's, it's more than half the effect of smoking. That is a, that is a huge effect. And so really the effect in that paper is an artifact of the very small numbers of people they had that actually had cancer and died from cancer. And so, you know, once you get down to small numbers, like a few sort of blips here and there, make big differences. And so relative risks in that sense uh, are, are, are huge. If you took those data out of that paper and submitted them to any decent nutrition journal worth its salt, it wouldn't have been published. So I just think that the people at Cell Metabolism who got their hands on that paper looked at exclusively or almost exclusively at the molecular data. And, and it's, it's astonishing. It's very, very good. And, you know, Walter Longo tells a great story about uh, a, a particular type of uh, individuals who have a form of dwarfism who lack a growth hormone receptor who have no cancer. And I mean, that's an astonishing finding. And it's a genetic, obviously, mutation that results in people who are short in stature, 
but it certainly indicates that these growth factors do play a role in the development of cancer. The NHANES data that accompanied that analysis, it w was, in my opinion, very poorly done. So his group is going to go on and use a much broader analysis of the NHANES data set to actually make the relative risk, not, not, not manipulate the data in a way, but to give it a more accurate representation of the, and to investigate if there is any connection between protein intake and its association with cancer. Again, because the data set that was used, as he just articulated, in the cell metabolism paper was so small. And so what that, that created that over-exaggerated the effect size that protein consumption would have on cancer. Uh, because as he went on to say, and I sort of chopped up the clip a little bit, that what this paper insinuated is the effect size of protein and its increasing protein consumption had the effect size almost on par with smoking, which we all know that that is probably uh, over-exaggerated. And so, again, his group within the year of 2022 is going to uh, use a broader data set, including more people that have actually died of cancer and looking at the associations if there is any. So I think that's important, and I do want to thank Gabrielle Line for putting out great content. Um, but we're going to continue on and talk more about IGF-1, because again, this has um, been proposed to be the molecular connection between sort of bridging uh, the physiology mechanistically with eating red meat and protein and causing the formation of cancer is because the theory goes, the thinking goes, that because protein is associated with increasing insulin-like growth factor one, and therefore driving the cellular processes that are linked with cancer, that is why that individuals propose that we no longer consume red meat. We eat bugs or we go on quinoa or soy or some such things. Well, um, let's look at the connections here, if there is any, with IGF-1 elevation uh, in its formation with cancer and dive into that. But first, I mentioned exercise, friends. Exercise is very protective. It's neuroprotective, cardiovascular protective. And so we're always looking for solutions here at High Intensity Health and Myoscience to support your exercise sessions. So the electrolyte sticks are formulated to do just that. You have creatine, you have real salt, you have albion chelated minerals like magnesium, you have taurine, you have accessory nutrients to help you recover and have a great workout. So as a listener of High Intensity Health, you can save using the code podcast at checkout over at myoscience.com. Uh, by the time you continue to watch this video, there should be the new lemon lime flavor that tastes phenomenal. You can travel with these stick packs. They can go right in your gym bag or your travel bag and your suitcase. Um, you can use them before you work out or intra workout during the workout to get the best benefits. We have over 250 some odd reviews. You can check them out over at myoscience.com. That's M-Y-O-X-C-I-E-N-C-E.com and save with the code podcast at checkout. Now, as I mentioned, IGF-1 is increased with exercise. So IGF-1, how does it even get increased? What are, what are some of the background and the physiology of IGF-1 that you need to be aware of? Um, to me, this is quite fascinating. I, I get asked a lot about IGF-1, and so I wanted to do a lot of, you know, sort of digging into this. And so let's get into this. IGF-1 is increased actually by the brain. So there's a mediator called GHRH, growth hormone releasing hormone that stimulates the pituitary to release growth hormone. And that tells your liver to make a series of peptides that are known as the IGF-1 class of proteins. There's several different IGF-1s and these uh, travel throughout the body and they are impacting growth in cellular pathways and uh, repair processes in the body, okay? Uh, IGF-1 also has six different binding proteins, insulin-like growth factor binding proteins, and these can be measured. And so several studies have looked at the connections between serum IGF-1 and its associations with the quantity of IGF binding protein 3. So like I mentioned, there's six different binding proteins. IGF binding protein 3 is the most predominant binding protein in the body. So if you are so inclined to test your IGF-1 levels, you may want to also consider looking at your IGF binding protein 3 as this is the most predominant one. And based upon the studies that I've looked at, there was one here in patients with rheumatic disease activity. And most of, most of the investigators are looking at the ratio between free IGF-1 and IGF uh, binding protein. So just understand that if you just test your serum IGF-1, that doesn't tell you a whole lot. You also need to know that relationship with the binding protein, okay? Now, the point here that I really want to emphasize is that IGF-1 increases acutely with a lot of health-promoting activities, as I mentioned, like exercise. So 
If on the one hand, we are going to say that eating protein causes cancer, but we are going to ignore the fact that exercising acutely increases IGF-1 to a far statistically greater degree, uh, especially in the tissues that purportedly are damaged by IGF-1, like the cardiovascular system, then how can those two things be true at once? How can consuming protein cause cancer? And then how can exercise be so protective in terms of preventing cancer and also preventing heart disease if we are in the same breath saying that consuming protein is bad? You know, sometimes in life, two things can be true at once, but in this particular context, it seems hard mechanistically uh, to make those associations. Now, when we look at new data since 2014, showing that there's actually not a linear correlation between levels of IGF-1 and cancer, and there's more of a bi-directional U-shaped relationship, suggesting again, that there's this sort of sweet spot with IGF-1 as there is with many other levels of hormones and mediators in the body. And it turns out that the association with IGF-1 levels and all-cause mortality and cancer and this and that adheres to a, a U-shaped curve, meaning that low levels of IGF-1 are just as problematic from a chronic disease standpoint and all-cause mortality standpoint as high IGF-1 levels. And so you don't really want to drive IGF-1 to the ground by never consuming protein, by, by being scared of protein, believing into this erroneous belief that it's going to somehow stimulate the growth of cancer in your body. Because low levels of IGF-1 are also correlated with chronic diseases. And there's actually, and I don't want to give away too much here because this is a presentation that I will be giving at Low Carb Denver in March of 2023, all more about the details, metabolically speaking, with diabetes. But there's research showing that in insulin-resistant individuals, there's a down-regulation of these receptors and there's changes metabolically within the receptors and that, that might mediate some of the connectedness here uh, with regards to IGF-1 expression and so forth. But metabolically speaking, when people have poor metabolic health, there's a down regulation of these receptors. And so that could be sort of implying again and, and, and firming up this relationship with this U-shaped curve, meaning low levels of IGF-1 are just as bad as high levels. There's a sweet spot. So the point herein is that it's not as simple as some of the headlines that you read on the internet that say things like protein causes cancer because it raises IGF-1, which is bad. It's not that simple. Again, IGF-1 is neuroprotective. Part of the way that we prevent neurologic disorders, uh, mild cognitive impairment, dementia, Alzheimer's, things like that, there, it, IGF-1 it protects neurons uh, through repair processes and preventing chronic neuroinflammatory processes. IGF-1 mediates the expression and the release of a protective molecule called nitric oxide. We know nitric oxide is involved in vasodilation and causing improving blood flow. So low IGF-1 means that you have restricted, narrowed, poor circulatory uh, function, maybe even erectile dysfunction and peripheral vascular disease, which you don't want. So again, the point here is that sometimes the media and sometimes lay press articles, New York Times, you know, uh, NPR, things like that, when they interview experts, they sort of ignore uh, some of these other details that I'm sharing with you. So we hear activists talk about you know, the benefits of, of getting off meats because it's, it's so bad for you because of cancer and this and that. But they're ignoring the fact that, again, there's, it's, it's not as clear cut. It's not as black and white. There's this U-shaped curve here. And driving IGF-1 to the ground is just as bad as having it chronically overexpressed. And it's a little bit more complex. So I wanted to kind of share this with you because I have read so many comments on our YouTube page uh, and on Instagram. Anytime I talk about protein or interview people that talk about the, some of the health benefits and micronutrients that are found in red meat, I get a lot of, I read the comments about, well, it causes cancer. Red meat is toxic. I would never consume that. Oh my gosh, how can you even be promoting that? Having you read about Walter Longo's work. And then you read these, these papers that show, well, actually, it's, it's not as clear cut. There's a U-shaped curve. Low IGF-1 is just as bad as high IGF-1. So we need to look for balance, friends. And that's why I encourage you to be more mindful about your protein consumption as we sort of finish off here. If you're very sedentary and you have no muscle mass and you don't exercise, uh, you don't deserve to be eating 10 pounds of animal flesh every single day. So your protein needs 
should be commensurate or match your activity levels. And that's why I think it's important. And one of my criticisms of some of the carnivore uh, people, carnivore community in general, or the, even in the keto community is many of these people who don't even exercise are just crushing protein. Now, I think crushing protein is better than crushing Cheetos. However, we need to realize, but gosh, you shouldn't be eating three ribeye steaks a day if you literally, your most activities like walk into the bathroom. Like you need to first make exercise the cornerstone, the foundation, the keystone of your life. That's how you're actually going to lose the weight is by moving your muscles, stimulating your fat cells to start releasing that stored energy, improving insulin sensitivity at the, the level of the muscle. This is really important. And of course, we know that exercise, as I mentioned now seven times, increases IGF-1. Uh, it does favorable things. And, and part of the way, potentially, that exercise can, and part of the, the, the benefits of exercise-induced increases in IGF-1 is the vasodilation. We, when we exercise, we improve the health of the endothelium of our vessels, and we improve circulation. And that is partly mediated by IGF-1. So focus on exercise and match your protein with your activity level. It's really quite simple. And, you know, if you overdo the protein and you're chronically consuming protein and you're not exercising, yeah, you might be setting yourself up for nutrient excess, calorie excess, and potentially creating a pro-growth environment in your body that is misdirected and could potentially lead to the formation of neoplasm. So um, this is just a primer on this topic. As I mentioned, Low Carb Denver, I'm going to put it in the links below. Jeffrey Gerber, and, and others have been putting on this conference for a number of years, and we just solidified this talk, and we're going to really dive into the weeds on IGF-1, what it is, where it's derived from, how to measure it, when to measure it, uh, and all the metabolic links and the receptor expression changes with metabolic disease in March of 2023. But for now, just understand that it's not as clear-cut. It adheres to a U-shaped curve with regards to overall IGF-1 levels and chronic disease and even mortality. So uh, hopefully you got some value out of this. What I'm going to do on the show notes page is link the articles that I talked about today and also the podcast with Dr. Gabrielle Lyon with Stu Phillips. I would highly recommend that you tune into that and listen to it and, and all that as well as if you're interested, dive into some of these papers. Uh, most of them are, are free on the internet that you can read more about and learn more about. But um, it's an exciting topic and I think this is an area of metabolism that hasn't really been well taught. I will say I earned a master's degree in human clinical nutrition and IGF-1 wasn't really talked about, but it, it seems to be coming up more and more. And I'm excited for you to learn more about it so that we can help people, again, if they want to go not eat red meat for ethical reasons or whatever, that's fine. We're not trying to convert everyone into doing this. However, don't be fearful of protein because of the belief that it just somehow magically causes cancer without a, a clear mechanism. So that's what um, I'm hoping to convey uh, in this message. So as always, I'm grateful that you tuned in. Thank you for that like button. Thank you for subscribing. And let me know what you think in the comments below with regards to this connection between protein consumption, IGF-1, and cancer. We'll catch you all later. Bye now.